Christmas is upon us. So, if you have your Bibles, and you should, turn to Isaiah 46. We're going to preach a little bit on who is Jesus. Makes sense to me. Um, just giving those guys in prison once again, uh, to bring that up yesterday on, on the DNA thing about who's your daddy, you know, and uh, teach them a little bit of why why it had to be a virgin birth. Man, they were excited. They never heard that before. And then that made me excited. Because I was excited when I first thought about it. But naturally, you get used to stuff. But my goodness, what a thing to have a virgin birth, huh? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we need your Holy Spirit function, clarity of thought, liberty of speech. Pray to be with the hearers that are saved, that they'd ask the food be filled too, Father, that's your command for us to ask and just trust you. Pray to be with the message, we want to honor Jesus, amen. In uh, chapter 46 and, and verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Isn't that good? We've got Genesis to Revelation. It's pretty good stuff, isn't it? The end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Wow. We'll stop there. I'll start preaching on another thing. But I'm telling you what, isn't that a statement? A pretty good statement by God, isn't it? What does that mean? That, that means he's God and there's nobody else. That means he's got everything under control. That means he's given us a book from the beginning and the end. We can know his feelings and his thoughts about what's going on. It means that no matter what they do, they can't change his story. I mean, he's going to do it. And uh, that's a good thing. And uh, we know that in uh, Exodus uh, 34, 14, you don't have to turn to that one right now, but in Exodus 34, 14, it says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So yes, he's, that's part of his character. He could be jealous and get away with it because he's got a perfect jealousy. So when we go away from him, we got to remember he's a jealous guy. And as a father, oh baby, anyway, won't get into all that, but I'm telling you, man. When he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images, Isaiah 42, 8. Take your Catholic friends to that one. Wow. And then I also noticed in the Bible, believe me, you're going to be having verses that you're going to turn to in a minute. But I also noticed in the Bible that in Revelation 19, 10, the angels refused worship. In Acts 14, 11 through 15, the apostles refused worship. Why? Well, it is wicked and idolatry to, to worship anybody, anything, any place, including Bethlehem, Mecca, or Salt Lake City, etc., I mean, other than the one and only true God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to Jeremiah 9, 23, and 24, that's the God. And you need to always understand that. And we don't, we don't uh, as Christians, we don't just blatantly worship other things. We feel it's like going to church with it or overemphasizing it. But if we really, if we really uh, uh, took a microscope to our lives, we'd be shocked to see what we do worship. It's like I told you this morning on backsliding. You're not going to even know you're backsliding when you get to a certain point. See, unless you're in the hospital, you're beat up by God. It's like we're stupid. I'm serious. When you finally get on your back somewhere, and you oh God, and then He starts showing you all this stuff. He's oh man, and then you live. He lets you live. And then another way, what happens? You get right back in the same thing again, and you forget. And what happens? On your back again. We ought to catch on eventually. It's pretty rough. And you don't have to get back up again. Amen. So, <laughs> now we'll probably only look up about eight of these. Amen. But we want to see who Jesus is, all right? So go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Believe me, he is not in the manger still. 
Once again, he is not on the cross. You see, this Jesus Christ that religion tries to paint is someone they can control. No, he rose again. He's loose. Ain't nobody crucifying him again. Nobody putting him in the cradle again. I'm telling you what, he's on the throne. That's who Jesus says. He's God. And uh, it's amazing how everything we see, you can say everything about God, but just don't mention Jesus. It's all over the place. It's in your face. Football, I don't care what it is. They praise a hero for crying out loud. He, I, I heard him. He's giving everything all about this and then providence and this and this. And then he's getting right into the end and they cut him off. Why? Because they knew what he was going to say. That name above every name. In Matthew 22, and uh, verse 43 to 45, the Bible says, this is Jesus' question to the Pharisees, amen? He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies a footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> wow! What happened? They knew the Old Testament. They knew he was exactly right in what he said. And it jacked their head up. Yeah. What are you saying? David called him God. Who? Jesus! David did. Go to Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7, why is this important? Come on, people. Preacher, we never said that. We didn't even think about that until you just said that. I know, but preachers just do that. Because somebody's listening to somewhere. And, it's, and it bores them to go over who Jesus is again. Because after all, they've been saved for 105 years. And they already know all that. And everybody already knows all that. Yeah, well, you're going to get it again every year around this time. If you get me mad today, I'll preach on hell tonight. Amen. It's been a long time for hell, hasn't it? Yeah. We're going to have the Lord's Supper tonight, too, this time. So we'll just thought I'd put it up there. It's important. It's one of the commandments God said. Amen. So over here in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, this is what it says. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Miracle one, virgin. Just miracle two, flat out saying he's going to be a son. And then three, you know, God's number. Names him. Duh. 750 years before he even comes. That's pretty good stuff. And then go to Isaiah 9. And I like this. Mm. I, I'm the Messiah starts singing in my head. Anyway, 9 6, Isaiah 9 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Second point is Isaiah called him God. David called him God, Isaiah called him God. Go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23. You hold God's perfect word in your hand, and sometimes we let skeptics come along and with geography or archaeology or some other kind of sciences try to prove the Bible wrong. Notice, number one, that they are a fool. They really are. They haven't studied this Bible. There's no contradiction. I mean, good night. If Columbus didn't come across that verse, you know, that the Lord sat on the circle of the world, he'd never branched out past that flat drop-off point in the ocean. He read and believed. How many Jews were killed as witches during the Black Death that swept over Europe? Why, preacher? They were living. They lived through it. Well, that'd be sort of spooky if they lived through it and nobody else did. Yeah, but you know what they did? They scoured with running water. Not only that, they burned everything. Why? Because in Leviticus, it tells you what to do with leprosy and these diseases. 
they did what they were supposed to do and until them, them, them dudes over there in Europe figured it out, started burning all those bodies, it spread like wildfire. And they blamed them. For what? Obeying God. We're so stupid, we washed in, in basins until after the Civil War, for crying out loud, wondering why everybody's getting gangrene, because you're thinking the logic and the common sense, you're washing off in a bowl, and you're using the same water to operate. Duh. See, that's what happens when God removes the light. Darkness comes in. Superstitions come in. And our country's getting loaded again with superstition, and people are losing their, their cotton-picking minds. They got no common sense. They rejected God. God's rejecting them, and they can't even see it right because they're blind. And Christians are succumbing to this stuff, even though God warned us about it. You mentioned Jesus Christ. He's God manifest in the flesh. You mentioned his name. He's your savior, stupid. Stop kowtowing. Jeremiah 23 and uh, verses uh, 5 and 6. Hmm. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will rise unto David a righteous branch. And the king, capital K, shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Look at verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, all capitals in my King James Bible, the Lord our righteousness. David called him God, Isaiah called him God, and Jeremiah called him God. Now go to Matthew chapter 1. Shipping with Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and, and mad at us because we don't. You read your Bible? You're fellowshipping with who that believes what? Jesus is just another creation, just a man? Buddy, you talk about Antichrist spirit. That's why we don't go with the ecumenical movement. We fought that thing when it started in the 30s. You better look at Baptists on that subject. Believe the Bible. John or Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 23. This is what Matthew says. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. How about that? Who said that? Matthew said that. What was he called? Old Testament. So Matthew apparently believed and called Jesus God. I like it. How about Luke chapter 2? This sounds like a Christmas message. I hope so. I mean, I really hope so. Boy, the stuff you got to put up with Germans and Catholics this time of year. I'm telling you, it's ridiculous. I heard a sermon was up north, and I think it was, uh, I forgot who was up there, but it was, it was Dr. Ruckman preaching. It was on you know, Christmas Sunday. Or he went through all the day and stuff that he did, you know, all the truth. And he says, but I'm German. We have a tree now like this. So I'm sorry. Wow. What a statement. Huh? Well, I don't have satanic laws, and we don't have a tree, but we sure got the holes. We got the lights. And I love you. Are you a contradiction? I don't know. I'm sorry. How about you? What do you know about anything? Anyway, anyway. <coughs> Luke chapter 2. Are we in Luke? Yeah, 2. Okay, look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Man, what does that mean? The enlightened one. The anointed one. The God. The Lord. Is what? A savior. Who said that? Who said that? Well, what does that mean, preacher? Well, I mean, if you look at it, I'm sorry, that was two. Did I say two? Luke 2 11? Yeah, that's what I said. So that's in the book of Luke. And 
And what's going on in this context? Everybody got Luke? Somebody's still turning. It's like Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's Luke chapter 2. Everybody got Luke? Raise your hand. Verse 11. Okay. So not only does Luke believe this, but what else is going on here? Did you see what's going on here in the context? Is this the heavenly choir? It says angels, right? I mean, angels are up there, right, where God is, right? These angels are up in the third heaven. I mean, that's where they, they come down. They just all of a sudden, the cloud opened up, and the shepherds are tripping out, right? I would, wouldn't you? A night with all the stars, next thing you know, boom, here's a choir singing. Give me a break. Thank God the guy come down and says, uh, fear not. <laughs> I mean, what would you do? You'd check and see if you had your medication, didn't have your medication, or you were around somebody that had something, or somebody put something in your drink. But no way I'm about to look at the beautiful stars on my front lawn and all of a sudden the choir. Wow. You just never think about it. these are shepherds. I mean, we're sophisticated today. We got all this technology and everything. I mean, you got Star Wars, you got all this stuff. These shepherds just eat man, they're eating, you know, drinking goat's milk, goat, eating goat cheese, Peter, and, you know, they're just minding their own business on a hill with, with, think about it. Shepherds and goats. They got no TV or nothing, people. No Cadillacs. They got Camelacs. They got all this stuff going on, and all of a sudden the choir happens. I don't ever thought about that. I thought it was hilarious. I hope nobody died. Get them old shepherds out there. That would, man, that would do it. But in Luke 2.11, we see what he says. And so therefore now in Luke, but guess what? The angels call him God. So if they're up there and they call him God, that's pretty potent. I'd say they knew who he is in person. Okay, go to John chapter 1. We, we all know this one. You should know this by heart. This Hair lips of Jehovah's Witness all the time. Especially when they find out that when they use that article, hey, it ain't in their Greek, it ain't in nothing. They're just jacked up. They just lie all the way around. But anyway, in John chapter 1, and look at verse 1. Talk about John calling God, amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A statement of fact. I mean, how good is that? It is real good. Then look at 1 John chapter 3. And I wonder if you know this. Pretty heavy verse, I don't know if everybody knows it. But John 3, 16, how about that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <coughs> then look at John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, and verse 20, the Bible says, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. <coughs> If you read that whole chapter, you'll be convinced that uh, who Jesus is, and you'll also be convinced that God gave all judgment to Jesus. So there's no Jesus people. That's who they see him, the judge. Oh, yeah. They will all bow. They will all confess with their lips who Jesus is. Oh, yes, they will. So John called him God, according to this. Go to John chapter 9. So remember, even in the Old Testament, under the Jewish economy, them prophets, when they prophesied and said who this man would be, they all concurred that he's God. We read that. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea. You can, I mean, you, it's all through the Bible, Zechariah. You can just pick them. When they prophesy about the Savior, about the Messiah coming, they give you a description, they give you a location, it fits Jesus Christ to a T. In John 9, and uh, let's see, uh, how about verse 35? How about I'm like asking you to suggest? Turn to the. <laughs> sorry about that. I lost my. Who I was? <laughs> Four minutes. John chapter 9, 
And uh, we'll read 35 to uh, uh, 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, talking about this blind guy. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he what? Worshipped him. Who did? The blind guy. He only worship God. And God's the one that can receive worship. That's right. And when Jesus Christ looked at that blind guy and says, you saw him. He didn't see nobody until Jesus. And when Jesus healed him, guess who he saw? First person, Jesus. And you got saved. First person you came in contact with was Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. And John 20. John's one of them Gospels that show you that Jesus Christ is God. What a Gospel. Mm. And in John chapter 20 and verse uh, 28. I like this one too. I like them all. I can draw illustrations and picture of this actually happening. It says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So you got, so far you got David called him God, Isaiah called him God, Jeremiah called him God, Matthew called him God, the angels called him God, John called him God, the blind man called him God, and Thomas, praise the Lord, called him God. Yeah, it's pretty good. Go to Acts chapter 10. We're on a roll, so we're going to do more than just David. Verses in case someone's keeping score. <laughs> and in chapter 10 of Acts, let's see, and verses 34 through 36. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Look what it says in parentheses. He is what? The Lord of all. Wow, so what's that mean? That means Peter called him God. Peter called him God. I mean, who would know him better than Peter? His ups and downs. He saw what Jesus did. He saw what Jesus went through. He saw him after he was resurrected. I mean, he was up in the upper room filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, he was strengthened, and he did convert his brother. And, I mean, we're talking about preaching 3,000 saved, 2,000. I mean, he got with it. Yes, he did. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And verse uh, 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, showing you the significance of the blood of Jesus Christ, also showing you the body that was present of God. It had to contain blood. Because they that worship God worship in the spirit and truth. If God's a spirit, he's got no blood. But he had a body, therefore he had blood. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus is God. Who said this? Paul said this. Paul called him God. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Corresponding verse to Paul saying that. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 and 6 this is what he says. Let this mind be in you which also, also in Christ Jesus, who being, he's talking about Jesus now, right? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Isn't that good? Sure it is. I like the verse. And took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Hmm. Being in the form of God, God is a spirit, but he's also male, <laughs> not female, not a neuter. Yeah, that's his form. Another part of the scripture, I don't know if we'll get there, but it talks about, well, I'll go to 1 Timothy 3.16, we've got to get the rest of Paul in here. But it talks about the expressed image of God, is who? Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16, we all sort of understand this, verse 2. About Paul, 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 Paul. First Corinthians three and uh, verse sixteen. This is that verse we we're discussing a little bit. And without controversy, what does that mean? There's no controversy in this statement. It's a fact. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Look what it says. God. See that word? God. What does that mean? It means God. <laughs> it says God was manifest in the flesh. What does that mean? Come on. There's no hidden meaning. It's black and white, Jack. It's Jesus. Okay? Look what else it says. He was justified in the spirit. Capital S. Seen of angels. Preached on the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received into where? Glory. Who's that? It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What does that mean, preacher? It means Paul definitely believed that Jesus was God. And through the inspiration of the Spirit, capital S, had these fellows write this stuff down. For our admonition, for our example, for our instruction in righteousness. We don't forget these kinds of things. And then Titus, just keep going to the right, chapter 2. It talks about, in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, putting them together. There are simple verses, but we forget this. We need to be put in remembrance of us. Jesus Christ is a special man. He was a very special person. He was so special, he's unique. Unique in a way that nobody has ever done what he has done. Why? Because very God came down and put upon flesh. It had to be a virgin birth because he couldn't have Adam's blood. Because if he had Adam's blood, sin would have been in him like it's in all of us. It had to be perfect. His DNA is traced back to God. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. She was impregnated by God not blasphemously, and not your mind being all dirty with the cares of this world and the filth that they show on TV. This was pure. It was holy. It was a holy thing that the angel said. Never forget that. He took a pound of flesh. So we got David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Matthew, angels, John, blind man, Thomas, Peter, Paul. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Why would you get bored looking up scriptures about your Jesus? You see what I mean? Why? Because you already know the truth? Man, you need precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. You need structure. You need foundation. You need some guts. You get guts from God. Character from God. From this word. You get bored with the word, you're backslidden. Get in it. Get in it more until you like it again. Taste and see it. It's good. It really is. Hebrews chapter 1. Yeah. Let's read 8 through 10. Talking about God the Father. Look at this stuff. But I'm the Son, He saith. <laughs> Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What's a scepter? Remember the king's sister with that big old scepter, that big old thing in his hand? You go to the Orient, you'll find out how important it is to life and death. Something like the thumb thing. That scepter is something, man. They watch you. 
supposed to represent the power, the power that he had. My goodness, what a, what a verse nine. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, in the beginning, you see that? Hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. So what we're talking about here in Hebrews chapter 1 is God the Father called him God. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5 and verse, uh, uh, let's see, 17, 18. The Bible says, But Jesus answered him, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, now look what it says, making himself equal with God. Wow. Pretty dangerous thing back then. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Uh, 58 and 59. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And in John 10, a lot of John, isn't it? Yeah, showing Jesus is God. I told you that earlier, remember? One of the distinctions in the book of John. Amen. And in chapter 10, look at verse 30 and 30 to 33. This is what he says himself, right? So I and my father, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to uh, stone him. Jesus answered him, Many good works have I shewed you from the father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And then, one last verse, let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Two. Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, what? The Almighty. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you, Christ called himself God. Christ called himself God. The Lord Jesus Christ was many times in Scripture, worshipped, and not once did he ever refuse it. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, he is the Almighty God. He is the creator of all things. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He always was and always will be. Right. And whatever poster you got with his names, they're all over the place, amen? I mean, he's God. He can forgive a man, a woman, boy or girl from all their sins, past, present, and future. He can give victory in his flesh over those things that displease him. Oh, yes, he can. He can do that. Oh, yeah, he can. For those who reject him as Savior, he will, he'll send them to a devil's hell, never to get relief, nor ever to get out. That's a fact. He can and will do these things. Why? Well, because he's God. And God makes the rules. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. He makes them rules. Yes, he does. When the Spirit touches your heart, don't reject it. Don't harden your heart. You've got to be very careful about this. It may be your last chance to surrender and receive him before you perish. I mean, without God, you're without hope. Hell's awful. You're never getting out. That's it. 
When he touches that heart of yours and exposes who you really are, you need to understand who he really is, and you need to cry out with all your heart and say, Lord, save me. So you don't go to that place. That's a fact. I mean, this is not, once again, just a baby in the manger. He's not the stable anymore. I mean, <laughs> he's not just a man hanging on the cross. And not just the missing body from a tomb that somebody stole. I mean, you think about he's God. He's loving, merciful, patient, wanting to save you if you're lost here today. Waiting to give you victory over your addictions, Christian. Wanting to give you peace. Wanting to empower you. Wanting to fill you and use you. So, I ask you, who is Jesus? My goodness, after this, Jesus is God. Amen. I mean, he is God. That's who he is. God, people. Get to know him. Read the scriptures. Know all about him. You need to know as much as you can about him. He's the physical image of Almighty God. How does he talk to religious people? How does he talk to sinners? What did he think was important and not important? Why does Paul says you follow me as long as I follow him? He says give heed to wholesome words, even words of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you stay in the Gospels. We know the stuff that applicable for salvation is Old Testament because it says so in there. A testament is not a testament unless a testator dies. Jesus came with grace and mercy. What a blessing that God would do all that for everyone in here today. So if you don't know for sure you're saved, you need to get there. If you've got some things you need victory over, don't stop going to the throne of grace to obtain that mercy that you need. Just keep doing it every day until you're sick of yourself. That's what you got to do. Don't worry about people at school or work. Good night. If you know who he is, they're going to hell. You understand that? Somebody's got to be bold every now and then. Just say, no, 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 <laughs> no. Jesus. I said, Jesus said that in the prayer. I said, Jesus said that in my speech. So you erase it. You take it out. Ain't no way I am. Hmm. Why would I do that? To please some religious organization? Or atheist? Jesus upset them. There's a reason. Because Jesus is God. Yeah. And they're going to have to deal with it. Let's all stand. Thank you.